Welcome back YouTube, MDEX Music here. We're gonna continue our series on how to write music using Mapping Tone Harmony Pro, decoding Beethoven. And our next step in the process is comparing and contrasting theme A with our piece and theme B. So this is sort of important because it's worth noting that these two themes uh, have this balance between what is similar about them and what is different. They can't be completely identical or else there's no point in doing it. And they can't be so different that uh, theme B has nothing to do with theme A. So the idea basically being that these two themes have to have enough in common with one another that it makes sense for them to be stated within the same breath. Uh, but not so much that it defeats the purpose of saying something that's completely the same. So if you're writing a story, you want two characters in said story, you want them to have something to do with one another. You want like a protagonist and an antagonist. So they have to have a common setting or a common connection to other characters in the story. So like you don't want like uh, Darth Vader and Jean-Luc Picard in the same story. It would make no sense. Uh, there has to be something similar between these two characters, but they have to be different enough for it to be warranted, uh, for it to make sense that we're even bothering saying theme B. So moving forward, looking at this balance between what they have in common and what's different. Uh, we're gonna compare and contrast, all right? So let's do that. So as we move forward through this next portion of the video where we compare and contrast elements of theme A to elements of theme B, let's keep in mind this whole evolution through mutation sort of concept. And the three best ways to achieve this are change the key, have some things that are the same, and have some things that are different. And we'll get this evolution through mutation naturally by keeping those three things in mind, where one thing is a consequence of the other. All right, so we're gonna start off by seeing what these two themes have in common, all right? And one of those things is quite clearly the rhythm, all right? So if you look at theme A's idea, and you have theme B's idea, which is, all right? So quite clearly you can hear they're both basically driven by this quarter note rhythm. So you have them both having pickup notes into the first complete measure of the idea and you both have them ending on that strong two at the end of the idea. So what else do they have in common, right? Let's look at maybe the fact that they're both arpeggios, right? So in theme A's idea, you're basically breaking the F minor chord. So that whole idea is based off of breaking that chord and theme B's idea is built off of breaking all right, so what we have is this chord that we're breaking now, which is basically just an E flat seven flat nine. This chord actually resolves to its one. So what we have is, is kind of cool. It's really just a five one. So we have theme A's idea breaking the F minor chord and theme B's idea breaking the E flat seven flat nine, which then eventually does resolve to A flat. This kind of leads us to one of the contrasting points between theme A and theme B. So let's get into those uh, a little more in depthly and talk about what are the differences between theme A and theme B. So the fact that like theme A's idea just kind of stayed on one chord and theme B's idea eventually resolved from one chord to another kind of speaks to uh, in general, how much more elaborate theme B is as a whole. It's sort of a microcosm for looking at the whole theme. It's a bit more, uh, more it has more tension, it's less direct. There are parts of theme B that are self-contained because it's harmonically more busy. Like that chord progression right there. This in and of itself is its own statement, right? And that's why you're gonna see this sort of literal repetition in B. Whereas in theme A, we had to play one chord in the idea and go to another one in the repetition 
Eventually going back to the one chord again. So you still have the same like 5-1 movement. It just takes a longer time uh, to see it or to get there. So we're basically talking about how theme B has a bit more to it. It's a bit more elaborate. One of the things you're going to see is the fact that theme B starts on the 5. It starts on this, that E flat 7 flat 9 that we talked about. It's actually the 5 of the key we're in. Uh, so you may be saying, wait a minute, Index, I thought we were in uh, F minor. Isn't C the 5 of F minor? Well, yes, you are correct. This leads us to one of the other contrasting points briefly, that the theme that we're on now, B, is in a completely different key than theme A. Theme B is in the relative major of theme A. So you'll remember as we've talked about before, uh, theme B is always going to be in a different key than theme A. And that's a contrasting point that needs to be mentioned before we go, go any further, right? Because our songs in a minor key, uh, we're always going to go to the relative major of that minor key. If it was in a major key, uh, you, you're, you have a bit more options as far as where you can go with the key change, but because our song is in a minor key, we're kind of more, more or less painted into a corner as to where the key of theme B is going to be. And that is the relative major of theme A. So yes, like we were saying, theme B starts on the 5 of our, our new key, all right? Which creates this cool uh, dominant uh, pedal point effect, which leads to that tension that we were talking about, and how B has a bit more of it than A, because you have this pedal point that eventually resolves to the 1. So also adding to the, the tension or the frenetic nature of, of theme B is just that rhythm on the left hand of those eighth notes across those octaves, uh, also kind of making it a bit you know busier and more tense too. So this is something you didn't really hear a lot of in theme A that you're going to hear more of in theme B. So one of the reasons that the structure and assembly of theme B is completely different than theme A has to do with one of our earlier contrasting points. When we said that uh, theme B's harmony or idea, just let's just use idea, was a bit more self-contained, that has a, a natural conclusion point to it, uh, that's what allowed Beethoven to kind of do a literal repetition in theme B, whereas he used a more figurative repetition in theme A. So that whole self-contained statement leads us to a literal repetition in the repetition. Which is one of the reasons the variation is so sort of drawn out and more elaborate. To give the piece a bit more variety and movement and to kind of, I guess, contrast that literal repetition. This also, most importantly, gives it much more balance, more than anything else. So the final contrasting point we're going to talk about uh, before we get into the analysis of B is probably one of the more interesting ones. And it's what kind of spurs uh, a lot of the previous contrasting points that we talked about. A lot of them come about as a result of what Beethoven does with regard to mirroring the shape of theme A. So theme B, if you could basically imagine like you standing on a mirror, you have the same image just an inverse of that image. And that's exactly what's going on here in theme B versus theme A. So it's almost as if we've gotten a contrasting point by way of a similarity, by way of copying. So you have the same shape in a completely uh, opposite form. So theme A's idea ascends up and then leaps down upon its conclusion. Theme B does the complete opposite. It moves down and then leaps up. So if you drew uh, a somewhat vague shape uh, by way of a curved line of theme A, you'd see this versus theme B doing a complete mirror image of that, all right? So what this mirroring has in effect done uh, is create a really, really cool mutation or evolution of the original idea, which if you remember as we spoke to earlier, is a really important element uh, within the grammar. This balance of having enough in common that the two ideas are related, but having enough of a difference that it warrants being said, all right? So this mirroring effect has done a lot. The, the key change 
is a mirror image of itself. Uh, the A flat being the mirror image, if you will, of F minor. Uh, just the mere shape of this descending arpeggio in theme B kind of leads to this more frenetic movement like going down the roller coaster as opposed to going up it as you heard in theme A. So the mirroring has allowed us to achieve a lot of these cool contrasting points, but also they tie into a lot of the original ideas that were in theme A. So as we spoke to earlier in the uh, part eight, I believe it was, about Beethoven's grammar, a lot of this is now coming to fruition when you start looking at the comparisons and contrasting points. All right, so now that we've laid out what Beethoven's grammar is, uh, what the contrasting points versus what the similarities are, we can now get into the third part of theme B, which is just an all out analysis of what's going on. Here we can get much more in depth into what the variation is because we've kind of uh, not done that really too much. So we're gonna get into a more in depth analysis of what the idea of theme B is, what its repetition and its variation are in our next video. So stick around and check that out. And if you feel like it, click on the subscribe button down below. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, keep the comments and questions coming as always. Thanks for watching.